Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Fall armyworms are aggressively moving through the state. We begin today with SUNUP's Dave Deacon catching up with our extension entomologists to learn how to identify and treat them. So Tom, you're actually working with some insects right now. What, what, what are you looking at? Well, um, in this case, we have uh, different age classes of fall armyworm. Mm -hmm. In the last few days, um, uh, actually Leland McDaniel, the extension uh, educator down in uh, Ardmore, mm -hmm. um, said he got 10 calls on Sunday about fall armyworms. Typically what you can figure is uh, after you see a kind of a peak flight, if they're out laying eggs, uh, usually with, within a week, um, you can start finding them wherever they've been laid, they'll start uh, making their act, feeding activity right. uh, visible. Um, you want to catch them when they're little. So we got some little ones in here. Okay. Um, just want to point out that uh, when they're at this stage right here, mm -hmm. these small ones, that's when you want to catch them. Mm -hmm. if you want to try and get really effective control. When they reach this stage within three to five days, they uh, can cause the most damage because in those last two instars, mm -hmm. in that three to five day period, they'll eat almost 90% um, of all the foliage that they ever eat as a caterpillar in, in that time period. So that's why we've heard farmers say, gosh, I went out and saw a bunch of little ones crawling around, came back a few days later and my fescue was gone or my teff right. was gone or, or whatever. So in those three days, it, this insect will, will, will do the most damage? Yes. And um, it's about a two, uh, 10 day to two week period that they go from egg to pupae. When a, when a producer finds the armyworms at this stage, what kind of application should they start? Um, it, take, take counts and look for visible injury. We always talk about uh, when they're at this stage, they're not capable of chewing down on the plants themselves. So the window pane, right. the leaves, right. and we have a lot of, you know, pictures showing that. So this is a stage when you see window painting and you start seeing some numbers of this size caterpillar, that's really the best time to, uh, if you want to get effective control. There are numerous insecticides that are registered to control them. Mm -hmm. We have a pretty active group here of, yeah, of, of army worms. How how do you how do you identify an army worm versus a corn ear worm versus some other type of insect? Well, fall army worms are, are kind of distinctive in in what they look like. Um, they all all caterpillars have what we call sutures on their head, right. but fall army worms have a very prominent. Uh, light colored suture that looks like an inverted Y on their head that kind of gives them away. They're also, their skin is kind of smooth. Uh, I don't think I want to take one of these home, but I'll, I'll return him to your Petri oh, dish. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> For more information on Army Worms, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. It's that time of year where markets don't move a whole lot, Kim. Where are we with all the markets? Well, if you look at what's going on in wheat, corn, and beans, we just haven't had any movement at all in the last uh, three weeks or so. You look at wheat, uh, we've seen prices in one location between $4.75 and $5.08. And so that is a 32 cent move. But most of that was big movement was in a single time period. It's mostly watered around $4.90. We've had a seven cent move in corn prices in the last three three weeks, 269 to 276, mostly around 273. Soybeans, a 31 cent price move, and that's nothing for beans, 699 to 730, mostly around $7.50. Uh, 15 cents. Now cotton, we've uh, had a relatively big move in cotton, 7 cents from uh, 84 cents down to near 77, so we have seen some movement there. As we go back, you know, it seems like back in June and July and August, we we had a lot of movement in the markets. Why aren't we seeing that now? Well, we'd have dollar movement in the in the wheat market, some relatively big movements. Of course, beans and corn prices were going down. I think we're uh, not seeing those movements because we've got a relatively good handle on what the Northern Hemisphere wheat crop is, and that's about 89% of this world's wheat crop. The, the What we get a, got to get a hold of there is Russia, of course. Then you've got corn, 
big crop coming in in U.S. corn and world corn. And then you got record U.S. beans, record world bean production. Uh, that's going to stabilize prices also. So we're kind of on that bubble. What are we going to have to do to fall off that bubble and push upward? Well, I think on wheat, uh, we need to get a better handle on what Russia's got. Their production is probably going to come in at uh, 2.55 billion bushels. You know, it's been uh, down to 2.4 and, and, um, and adjusted up. I think that's what got us our last dollar loss in our wheat prices. Uh, you look at uh, corn and beans, I think we've got to get some uh, export demand and we've got to have lower production around the world. How long before we know those numbers from the foreign crops? Well, if you're uh, looking at wheat, uh, we pretty much got the northern hemisphere, except for Russia, locked in. Of course, I think it's kind of get uh, hard to get information out of, out of Russia on what the deal is, but I think we're getting a relatively good handle on it. You've got Australia that's got a, a, a short crop. It's, uh, you know, uh, 150 million bushels below average. You got uh, Argentina coming up with a slightly above average crop. Uh, Australia starts their harvest in about two weeks, uh, Argentina in about five weeks. So it's going to be a while before we know that southern hemisphere number, but it's only 11% of total world, world stock. So we got a pretty good handle on it now, but it's at the margin and at the margin is where you get your price changes. Moving forward, what should producers be looking for and, and, and what should they do whenever they're setting up their marketing? Well, right now in, in wheat, they've got to watch Russia and they've got to watch this corn and bean crop in the United States as we get it in. I think another problem I haven't mentioned is the shortage of storage. Mm -hmm. We've just got, and that's got very weak basis. You know, our soybean basis is minus dollar and twenty cents. A few few uh, months ago, it was a minus eighty-five. Uh, you've got uh, uh, your corn basis low. You've got our wheat basis is relatively high because of quality. Right. But I think they've got to watch that basis and they've got to watch production in the United States and around the world. Okay, thank you much, Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. I think most sheep and goats producers are aware that the biggest health problem in small ruminants is gastrointestinal parasites, or what we commonly refer to as worms. Uh, I think most of them are also know that the dewormers we use to combat those parasites are not as effective as they once were. So we need to use other management tools in order to control those parasites. Well, one of those tools that we can use is a product called copper oxide wire particles. Now these are just little wire particles that we put into little boluses. Dr. Joanne Burke did a research project at the Dell Bumpers Research Station in Arkansas. And in this project, what she did is she took a group of lambs that had been weaned, and these lambs were known to have resistance to our benzimidazole wormers, or what I refer to as our white wormers. She divided them into five groups. One group got no treatment. Two of the groups got copper oxide wire particles uh, from two different companies. Uh, one group got dewormed with albendazole, and the last group got dewormed with albendazole, plus she gave them the co copper oxide wire particles. When she came back and did fecal leg counts on these, not surprisingly, the untreated group had increases in their fecal leg counts. All the other groups had decrease in their fecal egg counts. The greatest reduction occurred though with the copper oxide wire particles and the albendazole. The fecal egg count reduction that was 99.1%, which is really good. We have to keep some things in mind about copper oxide wire particles before we use them. One, they're only effective against homonchus contortus or the barber pole worm. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that when we use them in sheep, we all know that sheep have a low tolerance for copper. So you need to have a pretty good idea of how much copper uh, these sheep are receiving in their ration before you use them. Hey, if you'd like some more information about copper oxide wire particles, uh, if you'll go to sunup.okstate.edu.
There's still a lot of sorghum left throughout the state. So Josh, uh, walk us through kind of how the sorghum crop looked this year. Yeah, I mean, the sorghum crop has looked uh, pretty good uh, for the most part this year. The, the good thing is, and we've talked about it a couple times this summer, there wasn't any big issues this year. Uh, the sugarcane aphids were relatively low. We're, we're getting some spikes a little bit later in the year, but overall compared to previous years, we looked pretty good. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge growers had this year were, were weeds. Um, you know, we had a really wet year, wet planting season. What I'm hearing from around the stage is it's, it's little bits and pieces here and there. We had some aphids, we had some headworms, some chinch bugs. We had that long stretch in July where we didn't have any rain. It was really warm. So if you escaped some of those, the sorghum looks really good. Um, if you got hit by most, if not all of those, uh, it yields are, are maybe a little bit down. So let's move on to soybean. A lot of the crops still left uh, unharvested. What are some things uh, you were wanting to stress about when producers are going to be thinking about harvesting that crop? Yeah, as, as we're kind of wrapping up our, our grain summer crops, our, our corn's mostly out. A lot of the sorghum, especially outside the panhandle, is, is pretty well out. Um, a lot of growers are now starting to shift to, to soybean. Um, and with soybean, the biggest thing, very similar to what we found in sorghum, weeds were one of our biggest challenges this year, uh, especially as that dry spell hit in July and then we started getting a lot of rains, we started seeing a lot of late season weeds. So driving through the countryside, you can see a lot of soybean fields with some big uh, mare's tail, pig weeds, maybe some grasses that are a challenge. The, the bad thing is most of our herbicides are not labeled for this late in the season. Even our double crop uh, soybeans have reached that flowering threshold that is typically our, our uh, stop point for most of our herbicides. However, as we get towards harvest, growers have the ability to, to help manage those weeds, not only for an efficient harvest, but for future, future years in that field and that's the use of desiccation. My favorite is is uh, is Paraquat. It, it really uh, does the job really quickly, really easy, really efficiently. Most growers have really good access to Paraquat so they, they can get out there. The biggest thing is that's going to be really good on our broadleafs, our mare's tail, and our pigweed. Not as great on our grasses. Uh, we still, still can't have issues but uh, um, it, it really can help clean up some of those fields to make harvest efficient then growers, what they need to do is go back in and manage those again, because it, it typically won't kill those weeds. It'll just make it to where they can get the crop out of the ground. And then any sort of new growth before we get into really cold conditions need to be managed there. The one thing that growers have to be cautious of, we talked about it in sorghum when we talked about reaching black layer before we did any anything. Uh, soybean have a very similar thing. It has to reach that physiological maturity. And a lot of growers like to go out and just look at the color. You know, it's turning yellow. That, that can be misleading. What you actually have to do is just break open the pod. If the, if the seed has separated from the pod, we can typically apply those desiccations uh, without, without any issue. And what we like to see is almost that, uh, that, uh, that spot to where the seed attaches to the pod, it actually gets hardened off and actually turns a brown to black to dark color. And when we get that, that seed is successfully se separated from the plant and we can go in and start managing that plant for harvest. Moving to winter crops, uh, the 2018 crop wasn't, you know, the most uh, promising for a lot of winter, cr winter crops. Um, kind of walk us through, you know, maybe why that is and going forward for the 2019 crop, what crops, what producers should, you know, be thinking about. Winter of 17 moving into 18. The problem is we did everything really good. Most of the growers I talked to and walked through their management practices, they did things that needed to be done. We, we got really a hold of our our uh, fall insects, we were really timely on our nitrogen application. We just didn't have the rain, and, and that really hurt us uh, on the back end there with our, our lower yields. So whether you be wheat or canola going in, for canola, now's the time. This is, this is usually our really good week for planting canola, and with these good timely rains that we got over the last week, with a little bit of a dry spell, we can see a lot of our growers putting it in this week over the weekend and maybe first of next week. And, and we want to make sure not to stretch to that October 10th deadline. That's an insurable deadline. We can still plant. However, if you're insured, that's your insurance deadline. So you'd have to talk to your your um, your agent to, to see what the guidelines are for that. But we should be able to get a lot in. 
once again, good seeding rate, good weed control early, and, and the same with wheat. Uh, those worms are going to be a big issue. We've seen it with our, our dual purpose wheat, our growers that have already had wheat planted in. We've seen it with some of our late summer pastures. Um, the army worms are, are really thick this year, and so growers need to be really timely in getting any sort of control measure out on their canola, because really young seedling canola can't take a whole lot of army worm pressure, especially at seedling to, to first true leaf, we really have to make sure we're timely because they'll they'll literally just chop off that canola plant at the soil level and it, it just has, has a, a tough time coming back from that. So making sure we get a lot of growth up front, um, you know, setting that good root system, getting everything ready for a winter that may be a little cooler uh, than normal, then, then that's really uh, the best thing growers can do right now to set us up for a good harvest in 19. You actually have a conference coming up that's a little bit different from the conferences that you've had in the past. Kind of Talk, uh, walk us through what's going on with that. Yeah, so what we're gonna have this year is, is we're calling it the All Crops Conference. Um, and so what, what this is, is it's, it's kind of a, a, um, a, an interest from Oklahoma State as well as all of our commodity groups, as well as the NRCS, um, in the state of Oklahoma. And it, uh, it's not necessarily gonna take the place in no-till conference, but we're gonna try it out. It's gonna be around that same time in February 19th and 20th. Um, and what we're doing is we're, we're moving away from looking solely at conservation and looking at conservation and crop management from a whole system perspective. And it doesn't matter if you're a wheat farmer, a cotton grower, sorghum, corn, soybean, canola, uh, or if you wanna hear about conservation and cover crops and soil health, we're we're gonna have it all there. Alrighty, thanks Josh. Thank you. And for more information on that, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. On last week's Cow-Calf Corner, we visited a little bit about growing bread replacement heifers, those that are going to calve next spring, on wheat pasture. But during the course of this week, I received a question about growing those soon-to-be weaned replacement heifers, those that are going to go through a breeding season next spring and using wheat pasture in that situation. We've done some research here at Oklahoma State University looking at that very subject. And what we did was uh, put some heifers that had been weaned in the fall about the first week in December out on wheat pasture and left them there th into and through the AI breeding season in April. Half of the heifers we actually removed from the wheat three weeks prior to the breeding season and put them in a dry lot on a cell feeder with a ration that would mimic the same rate again that the heifers that stayed out on wheat should achieve during that same time period, and then compared the, the reproductive performance of those heifers. What we found was that there was no difference, no statistical difference in the way the heifers actually conceived to artificial insemination or to the eventual uh, cleanup bulls in the breeding pasture throughout the remainder of April and May. Therefore, we could conclude that using a wheat pasture as a growing program for replacement heifers that are going to be bred next spring would and should work very, very well for those producers that have that option available to them. The one place where I think there can be some real concern is if we decide that we're going to remove the heifers from this high quality wheat pasture, if we take those heifers off of wheat and then put them out on dormant native or Bermuda grass pastures where they have a real decline in the nutrition that they're receiving just to and prior to the breeding season. I think that's the place where sometimes we get some disappointing uh, breeding performances and blame it perhaps on the wheat pasture, but it was really the decline in nutrition right before the start of the breeding season that caused the problem. So in answer to the question, yes, I think we can use wheat pasture as a growing program for those replacement heifers as long as we keep them growing and continuing to gain weight into and through the breeding season, whether we stay on the wheat in a graze out situation or whether we move them to another pasture and put them on a supplement 
that will keep them growing and not losing significant weight right at the start of the breeding season. Keep that in mind and I think you'll have a successful breeding season with those replacement heifers this year. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. Daryl Peel has been traveling around Oklahoma. Daryl, how is the situation looking for winter wheat and grazing prospects this year? You know, it, Oklahoma is extremely green for this time of the year. It's really uh, quite amazing. Uh, a lot of the wheat has already been planted and a lot of it is up. Some of it is up very nicely. So I think we're gonna have some early grazing um, this fall. It looks really good. Some folks are fighting some armyworm issues uh, and that's, that's always a challenge. Uh, but uh, it seems that producers are well on top of that this year. So uh, we're getting lots of wheat pasture and other forage is growing well too for this late season. Let's talk about the economics now of winter grazing. How is that shaping up? You know, the budgets I've run recently looking at uh, winter grazing really look pretty attractive. Um, uh, now we've seen some, some changes in this, uh, you know, stocker market from a buying standpoint, but, but even with the uh, higher prices the last week or two, the budgets still seem pretty good. The futures market for spring uh, for, for feeder futures is offering an opportunity to lock in a margin. It's probably something that producers ought to take a look at. Let's talk about feeder cattle prices a little bit and are they kind of following those seasonal patterns that we see this time of year? Well, you know, uh, September is kind of a question mark in Oklahoma. The average seasonal pattern would be for, for feeder prices to drop from August to September to an October low for, for the lighter weight calves especially. We're really not seeing that right now and it can happen sometimes. When we do have a lot of stocker demand develop early, Sometimes the demand is a little bit ahead of the supply uh, of fall calves that are going to come to town over the next four to six weeks. And so uh, what we're seeing is these prices have actually gone up a little bit. I don't expect them to go up a lot more, but it may mean that we won't see the normal kind of decline as we go into October. It, it may be more muted this year or more sideways. What kind of guidance are you giving for uh, stocker cattle buyers and sellers? Well, you know, from a, from a buying standpoint, of course, a lot of stocker buyers are, are looking for that October low. And I guess, we, you know, given what I just said, we may not see as much of that opportunity. Uh, that said, again, the budgets still look pretty attractive. So um, you can wait a little uh, if, if you want, but I'm not sure it's gonna get a lot better than it is. Now it might get some better here in another three or four weeks. From a seller standpoint, of course, uh, if you normally wean and sell in October, um, you know, we may not see the normal kind of seasonal low. These prices have held up pretty well. So, um, you know, on, uh, with, with, with the uh, late fall forage growth that we've had, some of these guys may actually be pushing off that uh, weaning date a little bit. And, th and there may be an opportunity for these markets to actually uh, start to pick back up a little bit after that. Okay, we'll keep us posted. <laughs> All right. Hello, Wes Lee with your weekly Mesonet weather report. Fall arrived on September 22nd and with it came the first strong cold front of the season. On Wednesday morning, temperatures dropped well below freezing in the higher elevations of the northwestern states. As the front moved across Oklahoma, temperatures dropped by as much as 17 degrees in places like Newkirk, Foraker, and Nowata from the previous day. Lows on September 26 reached into the 40s in the Oklahoma Panhandle at stations such as Kenton, Boyce City, and Eva. Dramatic temperature changes like this can be tough on newly weaned calves or freshly delivered stalker cattle. This cold front brought more than chilly temperatures. With it came rain to one of the driest places left in Oklahoma, the far southwest. By noon on Wednesday, rainfall had delivered significant moisture to nearly all of the mesonet sites in the southwest quarter of the state. Places like Altus, Greenfield, Mangum, and Hobart all received well over an inch. The highest amount was recorded at Apache, which received almost two inches. This rain, along with the record amounts received last week in the southeast, East, have soil moisture levels looking pretty good. This soil moisture map shows our deepest sensors indicating that a majority of the state is at 50 to 100 percent of storage capacity, down to 32 inches. Next up is Gary with a summary of the September weather events. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well we certainly had an eventful weekend last week. 
with Fitztown receiving the second highest official rainfall total in Oklahoma history at over 14 inches, and everybody else got a pretty good dose too. But believe it or not, we do still have drought in Oklahoma. Let's get right to the drought monitor map and see what we have. Well, we still have those two core areas of drought uh, down in southwest Oklahoma. For northeastern Oklahoma, that area is solidly a severe drought centered on Osage and Washington counties, uh, but we also have that moderate drought and abnormally dry conditions surrounding that area, uh, and those are areas that are going into drought. So we definitely need some rainfall in those areas, and we'll take a look at the rainfall map from the Mesnet for September, and I'll show you why we still have drought in those areas, and also out in the far western panhandle. Well, the rainfall map for September from the Mesnet for the 1st through the 25th does show a really large area of rain across the southern two-thirds of Oklahoma, really from four to eight inches are widespread. And then the humongous total from Fitztown of 18.7 inches, certainly one of the highest September rainfall totals in Oklahoma history. Let's go to the departure from normal rainfall map uh, for southwest Oklahoma, the western panhandle up into northeast Oklahoma. Those are areas that were below normal for the month, believe it or not. Now some were right on the borderline, uh, but you can see down in south central Oklahoma, those areas that were from five to more than 10 inches above normal, and there's Fitztown at 15.2 inches above normal, at least through the 25th. Now the good news for the drought is we did have some rains that fell after the Tuesday morning cutoff to be considered for the drought monitor. So look for more improvements in the next map uh, Thursday. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.